So we're going to go from the uh, kind of surface of the marsh to the atmosphere exchanges, and we're going to actually look at what's buried under the subsurface. So the subsurface in coastal wetlands is super important. It's where the long-term carbon burial happens. And so we're going to be looking at different uh, rates across all these different systems. And first, I just want to call attention to what we think about in terms of coastal wetlands. So in the Northeast, and actually in a lot of different places across the US, as um, Ariana mentioned, we've lost a lot of our wetlands. We have about 50% of what we had in pre-colonial times. Um, but what we consider to have wetlands now actually has a lot of different characteristics. It's not necessarily the really beautiful salt marshes that you see um, pictures of and that we really like to show in our presentations. There's a lot of that wetland, about half of it, that is in a deteriorated state. And that can either be um, impounded behind a dike um, where fresh water is held on the surface or drained. Um, we do a lot of things to drain wetlands so that we can use that land for other purposes or farmed. Um, and that could usually is drained as well. And the Herring River, which we're talking about, um, has both the uh, flooded or impounded and the drained uh, uh, landscapes behind it. And so when we talk about coastal wetlands, it is really important to know what is going on in impaired systems as well as natural systems. And I would say our state of knowledge on natural systems is much greater than our state of knowledge as impaired systems. Uh, but it's really management um, across all those systems that, you know, where the, we have a, cha a chance to make some um, improvements. In our and just to show you kind of what those you know, impaired systems look like, this is the um, Herring River Estuary. And show of hands, who has actually driven out amongst the Herring River Estuary in a car or a bike or any of those roads? So my favorite thing is you actually see the sign that says Herring River Estuary as you're driving along in a car. And it is the only place, I think, that I've ever been, maybe the only place in the US where you can actually be in a car and be in an estuary. Um, and that's because a lot of the land that you are having behind the dike has had elevation loss due to some of the things we'll talk about. Um, and so if that dike wasn't there, you wouldn't be seeing, for instance, trees. So those trees are growing on a former salt marsh. There's not a lot of forests usually that grow at the elevation of a salt marsh. Um, we have. Um, uh, Phragmites and also typha, which is cattails. So we have this very large range in ecosystems that are behind this dike and are on a former wetland. So if you can think, no, that doesn't work. Whoops, go back. If you can think of that beautiful natural salt marsh, which is what you've seen a lot of pictures of, that is what um, took up all of the Herring River estuary, which is over about 1,000 acres before it was diked. And now we have these new ecosystems in it. And so what those new ecosystems are doing and their emissions and their carbon burial rates and more importantly or as importantly their elevation building capacity um, what is going on in the future is really important for our uh, predictions of what the consequences of both restoration or potentially doing no action um, in the heron river of course we really hope there's restoration but at some of these sites there might not be and so briefly, I want to talk about um, this elevation loss that could happen with a tidal restriction, because this is super important, because this drives a lot of the ecosystem change that we've seen since the dike was put in place, as well as what the um, importance of future actions will be. So in a flooded marsh, um, so this is a marsh that regularly exchanges, exchanges tidal water with a coast, the sediment is usually saturated with water. So if you've ever been out on a marsh, you go walking along, there's, there's pretty much water everywhere. And that water helps keep the uh, soil anoxic. And that's really important for preserving that carbon. So if you went and you took a carbon core or a soil core and you took it down to you know, 1,000 years of age of organic material, you would actually see very recognizable plant material. And that's because that environment is so good at um, keeping decomposition low that it is able to preserve even the structure of the plants. And so these, that's a key part of why these systems store carbon for so long. When you drain a system, which can happen when you put in a tidal restriction and then you lower the water table, um, you remove that water and in its place becomes uh, exchange with the atmosphere. And so you let oxygen come in. And so oxic respiration um, is a, a microbial process that is much faster than anoxic respiration, and you can lose that organic matter. And so you're able then to lose material that has been built over hundreds of years, and that all goes away. And that is why um, one of the reasons that the Herring River estuary has an elevation deficit now compared to um, natural marshes in the region. And once that happens, you have kind of this collapse. 
And one thing I want to show on the very far right, your right, is that when you have that collapse and you have that drop in elevation, the water table itself kind of stays um, the same. This is the groundwater table. And so initially, when you have an ecosystem transition where you lower the water table, you can have um, vegetation grow there that is tolerant of, of, of kind of drier conditions. So that's our forest. And so I showed you pictures where there's actually forest growing on the former salt marsh. Um, that, that is only because the water table is low, because trees don't like to be flooded daily with tides. That's usually a no-go for them. However, as you lose that soil elevation, um, you, you become uh, uh, non-compatible with trees, and so you transition to other fresh water. So in this case, we show typha. And eventually, if you're completely saturated all the time and your salinity might rise, you have to have a vegetation that can um, tolerate that, and that can be our Phragmites. And so there's important things going on with ecosystem transitions in these managed wetlands um, that we need to take into consideration. And we need to think about what is the carbon consequences of this, and that's not just their, their uptake from the atmosphere, but also what they're putting below ground. And then it ties very clearly into their ability to build elevation. Um, I know we've talked a lot about carbon here, but very intricately linked to carbon storage and carbon processes is the ability of these uh, environments to build elevation, because a lot of what they're building is organic material. And building elevation is really key in these ecosystems, because they're at the coast. And right now, we know that one of the threats we're facing is, is sea level rise, and just generally water rise in this coastal region. And so what I want to go over with you guys are some of the elevation histories in this region, and what maybe some of the implications are of those elevation histories in terms of carbon um, dynamics as well as future uh, resilience. So the first thing I want to show you is water level in the actual Herring River. So these are um, about a year of data in 2017 of groundwater or pore water levels at different ecosystems. And I'm going to try to keep all my ecosystems coded in different colors. Um, and so green is right there, that's Phragmites. The yellow or orange trace is typha or cattails. The purple trace is a shrub site. And then the blue trace is kind of that forest site. And as you would expect, um, and on the uh, y-axis, we have water level below ground surface. So at zero is where the ground is. And if you're lower, that means the water table's further down. So if you were digging a hole, you'd have to dig further to find the water. And so what happens is that where these water levels are is really a relation of how much elevation has been lost across the Herring River subbasin. And it's driving what vegetation grows there now. And so this is a snapshot of an, uh, of an ecosystem that has been in transition since the dike was put in place over 100 years ago. And so it's important to keep this in mind as we look at what happened in the past. Um, and so before I show you all the data, I want to tell you what I want you to see with all the data. Okay, so the first is that these drained and impounded wetlands are very, very different from natural wetlands. That seems like an obvious um, uh, statement, but that different history has really important implications for their future um, projections. And so we have to keep that in mind because we're not at a static point. We're, we're having a lot of environmental change coming up. That vertical growth is really necessary to be resilient to sea level rise, which is an ongoing problem. Um, restored marshes do grow vertically, um, and that's really important, and they store carbon. And as they um, are longer in age past their restoration date, those, uh, the capacity to store carbon and grow vertically does uh, increase with some caveats. Um, and what we've seen in the soil is that natural marshes store carbon at the highest rate of all the systems we've looked at. So different impounded and impaired wetlands, and our natural rates um, are highest in natural systems because our, our rest restored systems are all less than 20 years old. So now what data am I going to show you? So there's been a lot of data collected over all the bringing wetlands to market projects as well as associated projects. And so um, there's these color-coded uh, systems in the Herring River. So that's forest, shrub, phragmites, and cattails that I'm going to show you. I'm also going to show you data from natural salt marshes. We've collected quite a bit of that, as well as some restored marshes. And the reason we've collected some restored marsh data is we want to have some idea of what might happen to the Herring River after restoration. Um, and so we have places where we think they might be analogs. 
And so these are all on Cape Cod. They're all primarily on the north shore of Cape Cod. So we try to control similar tidal ranges, um, similar you know, inv growing environments, and similar elevations. So we try to control for that to just really look at, OK, what might be the future tra trajectories, and what is the carbon and elevation consequences of restoration? With that, most of the restoration on Cape Cod has been on smaller sites. Um, and at a smaller scale. So this is Quivet Creek, Creek and Dennis. And you can see the former culvert, which nearly blocked all of the tidal flow. And that was replaced with a nice um, opening that actually did restore the full tidal range. If you look at the tidal range upstream of that former restriction and downstream now, they have, it has returned tidal flow. I'd like to note that that's eight foot wide. So the Herring River, um, once it's restored, is going to be 165 feet wide. And this restored, uh, I think, about 10 acres. And it's going to restore, hopefully, around 1,000 acres. So there's a scale issue there. Um, <laughs> it's nice to think, oh, we can just add a couple zeros to this, and our number becomes big. But I just want to say that you know, that's what we're looking at when we look at these processes, because we don't have an analog right now at the scale of the Herring River. Um, but we work with what we have. OK, so for those of you who are, uh, might be interested in what we actually did, we went and collected a bunch of sediment cores. And these are pictures um, right now of uh, the tops of all the cores, um, starting from your left. That is Phragmites, those large roots in there are Arenchyma. They're how um, a Phragmites pulls oxygen into the sediment, and it's how they survive in some of these um, reducing environments. The next over is cattails. Um, and then we have kind of a very mucky shrub one. It's a kind of a dense. Um, next to that is forest. It looks very dry. Um, and following that is a restored marsh. It's even muckier. When marshes are restored, um, they are typically going from like, maybe cattails or phragmites to, to a salt marsh. And there's a lot of activity that kind of hurts their soil consolidation. And then finally, a natural marsh, which has got a very firm soil oil texture. And so from these, we're able to look at the last century of elevation change, um, as well as carbon storage. Um, so I'm going to show you first what the elevation changes looks. And this, this plot is going to have a lot of lines. Um, but they're all color coded like these. And so we can, we can kind of try to keep tracing them. The first one I want to show you is the black line at the bottom. So that's mean sea level. Um, that's from Woods Hole. It's from the, about the 1930s. And you can see there's different things that are showing here. So this is time on the x-axis, and this is elevation. So this is absolute elevation. And we determined this by measuring the elevation at the surface now, dating the soil back in time, and, and following elevation back in time through depths in the soil profile. And the first thing I want you to see is that the black ones at the black and gray at the top, those are natural marshes. They are very high elevation, and they are heading um, upwards. And that's because they're responding to sea level rise. Um, and natural marshes have a, a built-in ability to do that through uh, feedbacks between flooding frequency, um, productivity, so more uptake, as well as more storage. Um, because you're increasing the environment that can store uh, organic matter, which is building elevation. The next one um, is the tree, and that one's almost flat. And so if that needs to respond to any sort of sea level rise, do you, does it look like it's going to respond? It, it, it doesn't have the capacity to build elevation. So it is on an interception course with sea level rise. Um, below that is the, um, the shrub site. So that's the next lowest one. And you can see there's some variability in the two cores there. But it also doesn't have the sharp upward trend that we see. Um, followed by the cattails, that, there's some upward trend there in capacity to build elevation. And that's because it's more flooded and it likely has a better ability to uh, preserve organic matter in anoxic uh, poor waters. And then at the very lowest are our Phragmite sites. And those are definitely keeping up a sea level rise. Um, but they're, they're also very much perched right at sea level. And so those sites are continuously flooded. So in terms of our elevation histories, we know that um, if this system had all been salt marsh, we would expect, like if it hadn't been diked, I keep trying to do a pointer, I'm sorry. We would, ex yeah. Oh, that one. We would expect all of the salt marshes to, to have all looked like this. But you can see this drop in elevation. And that is due to activities that took place back here and their ongoing um, the consequences for in the soil. OK, 
Okay, so if 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 the dam uh, the dike had never been built, these systems would be up here and look like this. But this has really been an elevation loss. We've lost elevation capital um, while that system was diked, and that's important uh, because we want to regain that, and we want to regain the ability for the system to be responsive to sea level rise. So next, I'm just going to do some averages, um, uh, looking at um, the top 20 centimeters, so the most recent um, accretion. And so, again, I've got them color-coded from wet forest to shrub to typha to frag. So those are the Herring River classifications um, to restored marshes to the natural marsh. And the uh, line that you see in red is relative sea level rise over the past um, uh, since 1930. And you can see frag is really growing fast, and that's because the frag there established on a sandbar uh, after the dike, um, some changes were made to the dike. And so it is growing very fast vertically. Um, and so it's, it's, it has a great capacity to build vertically. What about the restored marshes? So these are two different um, pictures, and these are both accretion rate on the y-axis, and on the x-axis on this first one is restoration age. So zero would be it was restored yesterday, um, and we have all the way out to about 15 years. And on the second one, we have the same accretion rate, but we have it versus elevation. And so there's two things I want you to see is there does seem to be some trend upward um, as it's been restored longer. It has um, regained more close to natural, so these black circles, uh, accretion rate. But it's very dependent on elevation. So the super high accretion rate is actually um, Scusset, uh, uh, the Scusset Marsh, and that site had a huge elevation deficit. So you can see it has the lowest elevation here. Um, and so that's more akin to Herring River. And so that elevation deficit actually pushed greater accretion. Um, so these, these systems, once you are, do restore them, they can respond. Um, next, we look at carbon density. So that's how much carbon is in a certain volume of sediment. Um, and what I'm showing here in the red and gray bar is a um, continental US synthesis of coastal wetlands um, that Jim did. Um, and you can see, you know, most of our sites are on the high end of that um, uh, with some of the, uh, uh, these sites having slightly higher. We think that has to do with microbial processes. Um, and then finally, to get to the carbon burial number, you'll see here that carbon burial is a function of how much carbon is in a volume versus how much volume is increasing. And you can see here our natural sites have the highest carbon burial rates. Um, and the frag site is a little bit low, and that has to do with it has, um, uh, you know, slightly lower carbon density. Um, and so these systems here, this is the New England area kind of average carbon burial. You can see our, our, our marshes are at the high end of that. So just to conclude for this, um, tidal impoundment and drainage, these landscapes are not resilient to sea level rise. And that's really important because we need to build sustainable landscapes. And so in addition to that, that carbon consequence, so they don't store as much carbon. Um, and they are also, uh, because carbon and elevation are intrinsically linked, um, they, they have this declining baseline. So if you consider the future, your benefit of making changes now is actually greater because if you're going downhill, but you can change that trajectory to go uphill, it's better than if you're just staying flat, right? So. Um, and they, they can build elevation even if the elevation deficit is over a meter, which is really key because um, the Herring River proposed restoration has definitely got some elevation deficit to overcome. And finally, I just want to conclude carbon storage rates are greatest in our natural systems. Um, and so it's, it's great to keep our systems in a natural state. Thank you. Oh. So many people and funders, so I'm just going to leave us at that. Wonderful.